Hello, how are you? You know, in the olden days, people would usually greet me with, you know, kind of rhythmical movement with their hands together. Go on then. Thank you very much. It's so good to be here. I'm Daniel, your friendly host. First of all, good to have you here offline. Good to have you online. And we're here to, what said, save her now. What does that actually mean? I have no idea. Well, I kind of do, but I try and sound cheesy. But I want to give you a tool at hand because we know you all have a strong opinion. And for that, we would ask you kindly, I know it sounds a little weird, to get out your phones because I'd like to introduce you to Slido. So what you do now is grab your phones and scan that QR code. Hashtag save her now. I'll do the very same. And there you'll find a word cloud who says, well, whom are we saving today? Could be anyone, could be anything. I'm very curious and we're gonna see, well, whom are we saving today? And the thing is, Slido is going to be absolutely crucial throughout this event because during all the discussions and panels and keynotes, well, it's just a couple, we're going to have all of your questions the whole time. So it's not us just talking on stage and you listen, but we want to have all your questions and hear all your questions. Okay, good. We're saving the Earth, the world, planet Earth, the future, Mama Earth car sharing, the panda mum. Yes, I like that. Ourselves, humanity, life, the world, our species, hashtag save for now. Yeah, that's quite good. Humanity. So I think we've kind of agreed that it's not Britney Spears, but in fact, it is planet Earth we are saving. And I think um, I said at least someone would write Britney, but no one did. So we see Madonna. <laughs> okay. Well, if she needs saving, fair enough, we'll do that as well. But I think we've agreed on that a good part of our audience would like to save planet Earth, a.k.a. the world or Earth. That's great. So that's working quite well. And again, this is your voice. And if you want to be heard throughout this event, do it. This is the first question. I think it's worked really well. Now we want to find out something else as well and have a second question. And that's, well, how bad do you want to save her? And again, take a picture of the QR code. And if that doesn't work, go to slido.com and enter. Save her now. Yes. How bad do you want to save her from one, not at all, to five, save her? And three exclamation marks. That's interesting. Okay, so 83% of you want to save her now. There is, in fact, 19% that say, yeah, kind of, kind of. We still have time. It's okay. It's easy. So it's a staggering 79% as of right now. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> Someone may have slipped, but you never know. But people say, nah, it's not so bad. It's going to be fine. What does global warming actually mean? It's just a thing. Probably Donald is hiding here somewhere. No, I didn't say that loud now, did I? So I can see that a major part of you is convinced we have to save planet Earth pretty much now, and you really want to do that. That's quite good. So I think we have the right audience for the right afternoon. But we're still missing someone, because you may have noticed that I'm kind of quite okay in doing Slido games with you, but I'm not that good at actually welcoming you on stage and telling you what we're all about today. But for that, I have someone who is um, miles better in this. And I've got to change the cards because the funny thing is I'm going to introduce them in this form and function for well, the last time. Boys and girls and ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the founder and CEO of Ubik, Christian Adelsberger. Welcome on stage, Christian. Welcome, everyone. Super happy and super excited to be here. This is, a, this is a, like the peak of a very, very long process for me. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to be with you today. When I founded this company, I was ultimately driven by the dream and by the vision to create something truly outstanding. Something people would take a look at and say, Wow, look at this. No one else has ever done it like this before. 
So I really wanted to be a pioneer, I guess. It took me two to three years to find out what really matters to me. And I still remember that day in Greenville, South Carolina, where we had a four-hour workshop with a car-sharing client. And then after the workshop, we went for a beer. And at the beer, the client said, hey, Christian, I have a hunch. There's something that can really improve our business. But we cannot make any sense of the data. So do you want to take a look at it? And we did take a look at the data, and we saw super interesting patterns in there. And shortly after, we were starting our very first pilot for this new type of product in Seattle. Three months later again, the CFO of that company called me. And he said, Christian, what, what are you doing there? I see you guys on my p and I have no clue what you're doing. Can you please explain how, what exactly you're doing there? And I was, I was confused and, and puzzled in the beginning because the service fees that we asked for at that point in time were really, really small. <laughs> but then I realized he's not talking about service fees. He's actually talking about the impact on revenue, the revenue increase we create for them, the significant impact on their profitability. And for me, this was a, a total game changer because I could, I could feel through that telephone line at that point in time, I could feel the impact that our product and what we do is able to create in another business. And this has been kind of addictive since that point in time. This has been such a fulfilling and satisfying feeling and experience that I had at that point in time. So um, it, was, it, was, it was sheer crazy. And the funny thing is that, that a lot of people are talking about product market fit, and I have been talking about a lot about product market fit until that point in time. But in this very moment, I felt this is actually product market fit. So that is the thing everyone's talking about. Um, since then, we've been a little bit fixed on this feeling of creating impact. So we won more clients. We tried to repeat what we did there. We went to, went to South America. We went to Europe. We won another client, et cetera, et cetera. And we were able to roll out to over 20 cities across Europe and the Americas since then. Our clients have entrusted us with more than 15,000 vehicles that we currently manage. And we have delivered over 250 megawatt hours of energy through electric vehicles. So this was an aha moment for us. This was massive in terms of, oh my God, we can make a difference. And while we grew the business and while we scaled out, what happened was that other fleets, non-car sharing fleets, we're starting to talk to us and say, hey, what do you do there for the car sharing guys? I mean, this is really cool. And we also face huge challenges, specifically in the EV transition and in charging. Can you help us do something similar? So we discovered and we learned that the products and the value that we create each and every day for the car sharing world are applicable and can create a potentially much bigger value in the field of business fleets. So what this brought us to was the realization that we're not targeting just 15,000 vehicles, but 1.5 million vehicles. And I, I remember that moment when Rafael had told me, OK, Christian, I think we have to read you the business case. This, the business case that was true until now is not true any longer. We need to bump it up. Yeah? We need to reflect the size of the opportunity that we're, that we're after at, at the end of the day. And there's one more learning and one more realization that we had as we deliver mainly products around charging to fleets that are growing EV fleets. We don't only have an impact on the profitability side of our clients, like increasing revenue, decreasing operational cost. No. 
At the same time, we create a significant impact by reducing CO2 emissions. And this was something new for us. We were so focused on creating business value and focusing on revenue generation. And at the same time, we saw the amount of CO2 that we save through providing our services was grow were growing tremendously. So this summer, we will roll out our charging product with one of the leading car manufacturers. This is a huge, exciting milestone for us. Again, we can multiply our impact. This year, we set ourselves the goal to save over 1,000 tons of CO2 through the delivery of our products and services. And I remember the moment when we had our last offsite with the team. We were discussing this and we we're discussing this. Oh, listen, I mean, if we have this like 300k MRR now, this translates into 60 tons a month that we save. And it's like, oh my God, this is massive. This is, this is really able to make a difference. And that's also the spirit that, that is new in us as a company to recognize, no, no, we're not, just, we're not just a tiny little startup doing something here, but we can make a difference. But let's be clear, what is in front of us, that challenge to slow down the pace of climate crisis, this is not going to be an easy one. This is a bumpy road ahead. This is an uphill battle we have in front of us. And we believe that this mission, as big as it is, deserves a new brand. And that brand is Nectar. actually one more thing and let me step down because this is a little bit more intimate <laughs> I have to share with you um, there's one more learning I want to share with you that I had while building this company and and I'm a little bit embarrassed to talk about it because it, it should be obvious um, to me I had to actually learn it the hard way um, and that is how much people really matter and that's something that um, I said I had to learn it the hard way. When I founded the company, I had a pen and a paper, and it was pretty much it, right? And at a certain point, you have people working with you, working for you. And I realized to really create an organization that is able to be successful, truly successful on a global scale, that organization needs to be smarter, better, more creative, than I can ever be as a founder. So that was the moment where I decided to create an organization and to enable an organization that where people can shine, learn, and grow. And it's 
incredibly amazing to be able to work with such a fantastic team right now who made all of, all of this possible. So thank you for being with me <laughs> and standing by me and having my back when it's needed. But we also work with over 20,000 people out there in various cities across the markets we operate in. 20,000 people that deliver the value of our product each and every day. And we believe that there is a huge opportunity of giving those people also the, op the opportunity to grow themselves. So we are creating a framework to enable them to learn and to educate themselves and be the forerunners of this transition that is happening right now towards sustainability and, and climate tech. So that said, today we will start our very own, yes, our very own 1.5 degrees foundation, which is the framework for all the people we work with to learn and to educate themselves and to put themselves on a personal development path and really make a change. So next to our business impact and the, C and the impact on CO2 reduction, this is the third pillar of our company we want to start today. Do we know everything on how we have to do that and what it's looked like? No, we don't. And that's why we need you to contribute today. We will have a workshop at the end of the session and we need your input, but we also need you to challenge us, to question us, and to share your thoughts on how we can make things that they will really make a difference. Thank you. <laughs> you did move off the stage, didn't you? <laughs> you did. That was impressive. First, I got, to, I got to say a new title. So the founder and CEO of Nexture. How does that sound to you? <sighs> Relieving. <laughs> Finally being able to, to say it out loud. I mean, and I didn't take note of that before because I was so worried I'd say it out loud before you. Because, you know, when you have a little secret, you say, just don't take note of it. I love the way you brought it over. And you said, I mean, you said a lot of important things. But Christian just said, what, what, what we want is that today you contribute you challenge, you give us the input. And that's why we're using Slido, that any type of question today is something where we, amongst friends, amongst contributors, discuss openly together. So here, use this to ask whatever you're thinking about. It's not about putting us on the spot or challenging us. We'll have a panel starting shortly, but contributing with your minds, your ideas. And I love the way you said the 1.5 degree foundation. We don't know everything yet, but we'll find out. So. Without having looked at Slido, I trust you have a lot of questions. Let's switch. Oh, 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 let's switch there. Let's have a look at some of the questions. Superb. What a beautiful brand and message. Great company. That, that's a nice way to start off Slido. I quite like the next question. So what is Nexture about? Tell us a little bit about it. What is Nexture about? Nexture is about Successfully managing that transition that is in front of us, uh, the transition towards the electrification of mobility at the end of the day. And this is a huge one. This is not something that's done in like three, five years. This is a huge transformation, technically, but also culturally. Yeah? Because at the moment, the biggest, let's say, roadblock towards that transformation is actually the resistance coming from people, not necessarily willing to take that steps to change their behavior they've learned along the last decades. And we are, as a company, we see ourselves as an accelerator towards that EV transition, giving all those other companies who are confronted with those challenges, tools and products and systems in their hands to enable this in a successful and also in a cost-effective way. By the way, you can upvote certain questions as well. We think, oh, that's a good question. It's not mine, but I like it. Just give it an upvote. It's hard to know where we should stand, right? Kind of yeah. going up and down and up and down. Okay, here's a good question. Oh, it's gone. No, it's okay. I'll, I'll do it. How much more money? <laughs> that, that's what it says. Someone says, how much more money? I'm, I'm not sure, like, payment or bribe or revenue, but so how much more money? <laughs> You're the CEO. You have to know. 
How much more money? Um, it's, a, it's a very good question. It's um, something that um, can, never f <laughs> can never fully be answered. But um, when it comes to, to our, our own funding, we closed a first closing of a Series A round last year with a volume of 4.3, 4.5 million euros. And we're complementing this Series A round with a Series A extension now this year. Um, with uh, roughly volume between 2 million and 2.5 million, million, so a total volume of 7 million euros that will fuel our activities in this area and the extension of what we do now from our core markets to also addressing a much larger business fleets market. Thank you. And maybe one more question. Before we extend our round, how do you feel about the new brand? Half an hour ago, 30 minutes ago, I found myself standing out there and it, it, a picture that came to my mind was actually, I had the sequence in my mind when I was going with my wife to the hospital for <laughs> actually she giving birth to our first child. And this brand here feels like really like giving birth to something. Uh, deeply rooted inside yourself, right? So this is not, not something strange or new or alien, but extremely close to what you are, but at the same time something that you want to be in the future. And that's what the brand feels to me right now. What a lovely personal answer. Maybe I have to follow up one more question. Well, what does next year mean? <laughs> that's what they want to know. What does next year mean? Um, it, it can mean a lot. We, we actually left it open. It doesn't have a clear defined meaning for us. Um, what I read in next year is the future, right? I read, I also hear ambition in there. So there are a lot of different meanings you can, you can basically carve out of that brand next year. As so many questions. So who's the big car manufacturer? That, that's the next one. It was one of the questions? Yes. Yeah. Ooh, uh, <laughs> yes. We will be <laughs> yes. able to announce that hopefully very, very soon. <laughs> it's a big car manufacturer. Good. Thank you for that bombshell. Okay, good. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to extend this round a little bit. And while well, you have the choice of choices, good, please do take a seat. Because we'd like to, we said, look, there's a lot of questions you're going to be asking, but we also want to extend a couple more angles to this. And therefore, we're going to have somewhat. I think it's kind of calling it a panel means it's so exclusive, but it's just a couple more people joining us on stage for you to ask us questions and for us to give them viewpoints. And why invest in climate tech is the overall topic. And for this, I'd like to get Lars Hennersdorf and Franz Zeuchbauer to join us on stage, please. Please welcome Lars and Franz. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. And as we like doing things differently, I kindly ask you to introduce yourselves. Let's start with you, Franz. Who are you and what do you do? Yeah, I'm Franz Zeichberson. I'm uh, with Verbund. So Verbund is the uh, leading energy company in Austria. And I'm, within Verbund, I'm leading ventures and innovation. So I'm managing director so, uh, of Verbund Ventures. Um, but but my, my main purpose is so, really so, to accelerate energy transition and to work on so, uh, fighting climate change. Thank you very much. Lars. Yeah, hello, everybody. Lars, my name. Um, I represent the Venture Arm of Energy uh, 360 from Zurich in Switzerland. Um, we are um, investing in startups like Next Channel, the new name, and other companies. We have a portfolio, about 15 companies in our portfolio. And um, I mean, in the end, our core mission and vision and, and job, um, doing this job for Energy 360 is also to transform the energy um, we I pre represent, as I said, um, Energy 360, which is a gas supplier. And um, we all know that gas is not probably the, new, the future um, energy source, so we have to change a lot of them. That's why we are here. Potentially, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, and the founder and CEO of Next Year. Just to kind of let that ring again. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. There was one last slide question I saw, by the way. Someone said, what's going to happen with the Ubic name? What's going to happen with the UIC name? It, um, we will actually put it on a paper ship and let it sail 
down the ocean. No, we're going we're gonna to close that chapter of Ubik uh, and not going to utilize that anymore. Well, that's a strong, last going, oh, wow, that's a strong statement. Well, that is a strong statement. So we, we'd like to talk about climate tech a bit, because what I thought was interesting, the way you started off talking, Christian, was before that we were talking about growth and revenue targets, and suddenly you said, we noticed that revenue was going up and CO2 was going down. So that seems like a new discipline, a new way of also assessing success and non-success and seeing targets. But why is it, why do people invest in climate tech? Because, I mean, on the other hand, that could, could be nice to have, but it could be riskier. And some people might say, why don't you put all the money you have in crypto? For example. That's easier. Which is a really good question. <laughs> Thank you. But in, but in, 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 in our case, it is... I think the answer is quite short. We have to support the climate change. And I can't see the, um, the, the, the drive to influence that change coming from governance or administrations or states or whomever. I think this change has to be driven by, um, yeah, let's in the end by, by energy companies who want who be part of the transformation on the one hand side and on the other hand side, um, who wants to build up new business models. And in our case, to make that a bit more clear for you guys, we invest in, in companies, um, in this case, climate tech companies, where we convinced to do the right thing. So that means in our case, we, we need um, open innovation approaches from outside. We need innovations, what we can use also for our own business lines, um, besides to our core business, which is gas, as I mentioned already. We also have a very strong, um, p &L on mobility, and there I see a lot of um, opportunities for us as well to benefit from, in this case, uh, UBIC or Nexia. Just a quick follow-up. Did you say that energy companies should be the driver in this? Would you care to elaborate? So you're saying kind of energy companies should be the, the key drivers of climate tech investments? They can be a key driver. Oh, I like that. Um, um, I think that every company should be a driver so, um, to take so, uh, climate change. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's for all, uh, all companies and so, for the whole society, it's a license to operate so, that we tackle this, this issue. Yeah. Um, you all remember so, last year there was the COP in, 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 in Dubai so, with a strong uh, final statement. It's the beginning of the end, so, the end of the fossil fuels. And um, <clears throat> we have experienced um, the hottest year uh, in history so, uh, last year. I think also the hottest February in Austria so, this year. I think there's really an urgency so, to do more for climate change. Um, and it's quite important so, that we support as Verbund, as Verbund Ventures, also innovative companies like, like Nectar so, to speed up uh, with this transition. Now I'm curious, now the two of you or the two, two companies you represent both invested in Nectar. Right, that's also kind of the setup here to, 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 make, to make it straightforward. Now, Christian, I'm curious, when, when, when this whole thing started to pull off, was it, I'm just really interested in this, was it mainly discussing business numbers and growth or how strong were also obviously CO2 numbers relevant in negotiating these individual, I think deals always sound so, these, mm -hmm. these, these partnerships? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Um, Thank you. The <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> no, it, no, no one ever asked that before, and it, but it's an interesting one. That's why that's why I pointed out. Um, for me, uh, it, it is it is still a lot about the business performance of, of a startup in terms of being able to sustainably create that impact, right, from a financial point of view. Because if if the financial baseline is not um, is not there if you don't meet certain minimum requirements that you're going to survive financially, right? That you have a minimum of success in what you do on, in a, on a business scale, then a lot of other activities will soon stop anyway. So I think that in, to, to answer your question there, the focus was in the beginning definitely a lot on the typical metrics that you would look like uh, when taking a look at a startup. The deeper and more and more the deeper our relationship got, the more we also got into um, the let's say impact measures in terms of CO2 reduction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but what, what you touched there was really interesting because I think at the moment what is really really tricky 
um, if, I would in, if I would have to invest into climate tech, I found it really, really tricky to keep the balance between, let's say, business success of a company, right? And the sustainability impact, because there are a lot of great, fantastic sustainability impact initiatives out there. Will they necessarily provide a good business case or even a working valid business case? Maybe not so much, right? And that's, that's one of the challenges that I, that I do see there. And, and I'd like to add what, I, what, I, what I'd find interesting would be to, to hear you. And again, any type of questions you want, shoot away on Slido, because I mean, I did get a plus for my question right now, but probably all a lot smarter than I am, so, so go for it. But I did get a plus. Now, if we say, okay, investing in a company that purely drives revenue, that purely focuses on maximizing that revenue versus a company that focuses on revenue, but also creating impact, and on top also starts a foundation. I mean, if someone says, look, I'm actually just interested in increasing my money, that's kind of very hard to get by. So I'd also be interested in, in, in the two of you, is, is investing in climate tech, I mean, you both said it has to be done, but is it also an increased risk? And does it require longer return times as well? Whoever feels obliged to answer. Uh, investing is always in the risk, <laughs> a risky thing. But um, if you look so in the field of climate change, so and uh, we also have to think about so which problems are addressed by the startup uh, and uh, have so the, uh, has the, the, the founder and the team the ability so really so to be successful in addressing so, uh, these problems and then scale a business in this sense. If you look so in the field of climate change, so we all know so, um, the world is investing a lot in renewable energy. Uh, and I think so we have the technologies, we have hydro, we have wind, we have solar. So we so that's, uh, these technologies are quite com competitive. And this morning, uh, uh, I received an email in my inbox with an interesting number from Bloomberg that last year, that was uh, the first time that investments at a global scale, investments in electrifying transport, succeeded so, uh, investments in renewable. And that's so, also interesting to so, be here today uh, with you, Christian, so, and, and, and Aksha, so that you're addressing so, the both sectors. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I think it's quite important so, that we now look so, which companies are addressing so, the main issues and the main problems so, of today um, in order to create future business. So when we are investing uh, as Verbund Ventures, so we are investing in companies so for future business, not for business today, but investing in people having the ability and the knowledge so to addressing these problems in the right way. Maybe just as a follow-up on that, because someone else is getting a plus from me, um, someone, a certain anonymous would like to know which climate KPIs are you looking at when investing in climate tech companies? Are there specific ones to the two of you? It's, it's a great question. And if not, what could they be? I think one obvious KPI is just to um, invest in companies who can reduce emissions. Of course, this is uh, one KPI where we are really, really focused on. Another KPI from our perspective is um, to invest in companies, which is not primarily a climate KPI, which is more a kind of success KPI, is the team, is the founder team, the, the, the management team, the right team. So I really, really totally convinced that you can invest in a lot of different uh, startups, companies, and business models. But when you see that the, the management team is not really, you know, the, the right one in this place, mostly um, you will get problems in the next following months and years then. So that's my experience. So to, to give a clear answer, climate KPIs, of course, re reducing emissions um, and, and also helping um, driving new business models for areas like mobility in this case. Um, for us, climate KPIs are the baseline. So um, we only invest so, in, in companies so, uh, which are in the field of renewables, so reducing um, emissions, so increasing uh, energy efficiency. So we look on other KPIs and financial KPIs because so, climate KPIs are really the baseline for us. Mm -hmm. It's a must. It's a must. Okay, I like that. And, and I also think it's interesting. I'd be curious to see how this discussion would change if we'd have that in a year, in two or in three years, what the final KPIs will be, that'll be a standard. Um, 
now we just kind of switched, so I go back to my phone. By the way, when you see me playing on my phone, it's not me and my wife going forwards and backwards, it's actually me reading Slido. There was a second question which also came up, um, which says, EVs will obviously be part of our transformation. Which other mobility solutions are you planning to support in the future? Probably more direction of Christian. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um EV is at the, at the center of what, what, what we're doing. I mean, we started off focusing on the shared mobility segment, which is by, also by default a, a more sustainable way of mobility because you share resources, right? Um, we extend that now towards supporting EVs also in the, in the business fleets world. And this is a challenge big enough that we think we'll stay focused on that um, and not necessarily Go beyond, um, go beyond, go beyond that, right? So this is something that will that will drive and that will give us the focus for the next couple of years. Thank you very much. Now the thing is, we're seeing that there's a lot of questions coming in now. But just like climate change, we don't have time. So we have a second panel that's going to follow up now. But same thing with climate tech, and you know the whole thing. If we do things, it's too late. That's bad. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and wrap up this first panel and say thank you for the ones who are asking questions and be fast on the second panel. Now I'm going to try and summarize what we learned right now because time flies, right? And you by nodding say yes, you're right or no, you got that totally wrong. Okay? Okay, good. So we've understood that um, <laughs> the energy change is, it has to happen and it's non-negotiable that we engage in that. We've understood that investing in companies, uh, no, there's something else I left out. We, we saw that the energy companies are probably going to be the driver in the major transformation. That's what you said, Lars. You're going like, yes, you hope so, you hope so. That's at least what you're saying. You were kind of on about that, Christian. You kind of laid back and listened to the two of them at that point in time. And we understood that every company has to invest in this. We understood that business performance is still the key in climate tech companies, it's still the absolute key and the financial baselines, but still uh, on top of that, being able to create the change is getting more and more important. And that climate tech is not just about business, but in creating impact. We understood that Nectar does both, which is very good, and that driving new businesses is also a very, very relevant factor for the two of you if you'd like to invest. What I found interesting was also, if I can carry this away, is that direct KPIs on understanding the impact that climate tech creates are still not there. They're still very early. We're both saying, yes, it's about the people and it's about the baselines, but it wasn't like uh, it's cash flow or it's gross margin. So it's something which is still there to be developed. Um, but what I took away as strongest was investing in climate tech is non-negotiable. And I'm pretty sure it's probably in a couple of years time, it's going to be like talking about color television. You're going to stop adding the color because it's obvious that every company has to be a climate tech um, if you want to remain sustainable. Did I get that kind of right? Mm -hmm. Perfect. You're happy yeah. as well? It's a part where you applaud. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> now. What we're going to do is we're going to say goodbye to Lars and Franz. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It was a Thank pleasure. You. Right that way. And Christian, we're going to change perspectives, we said. We're going to do one shift to the right and one to the left in three, two, one, go. Oh, thank you. That happens when you change perspectives. Sometimes you break things. Absolutely. And it's fine. <laughs> See, that's the thing. You can break things and you can repair them. Just if you don't want to break things, nothing good happens. So we change perspective because in times of well, decarbonization, we also understood that sometimes we'll have to have people join us, not just on stage, but also in a remote setting. So the second panel we're going to have now is on advancements in decarbonization, technology and innovation as drivers for exactly that topic. And for this, I would like to welcome yeah, our remote speakers, and that would be the moment where we see them now. That was dramatic, wasn't it? I'd like to say hello to Til, Xiaomin, and Christians. You can applaud because they'll be able to hear you. <laughs> Thank you.
That's so cool that your heads are moving. You can't see that, right? But we can. This is really a nice feature. So, I was just saying this early on. We like doing things differently. So, therefore, I kindly ask you to introduce yourselves. And I'd say we'll start with Xiaomin. Hello. Who are you and what do you do? Hi, everybody. Um, hi, I'm Xiaomin. Um, I'm based in Vienna and I lead um, IFC's venture capital investments in the Central and Eastern European region. Uh, you might ask, what is IFC? It stands for International Finance Corporation. We're a member of the World Bank Group and it's the largest global development institution focused on the emerging markets. Um, just to give you an idea, we work in more than 100 countries. And uh, in 2023, IFC committed uh, $43.7 billion to private companies and financial institutions in developing countries. Wow. Thank you very much for joining us. Till. Yes, thanks for inviting me. And uh, hello to Vienna. Uh, these uh, pictures that I see here on the screen, it reminds me of the Harry Potter movie I watched with my daughters on the weekend, where you have these uh, pictures of moving uh, uh, persons on there. So I hope we can provide a bit of magic in your uh, room as well. Yeah, so I'm Till. I'm a partner at Set Ventures. Uh, we are a, a venture fund focused on carbon free technologies, uh, technologies for carbon free energy systems. So we've invested in this area for over years all across Europe. Uh, we have also two venture firms that we back uh, in Austria, uh, one in Vienna and one in Graz. Uh, so we're always happy uh, to be connected to the Austrian venture space. Uh, currently, we manage a 200 million venture fund uh, for our next uh, round of investments. Thank you very much. And Christians. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. I'm joining you from Riga, Latvia, and I am one of the co-founders of OX Drive. And what we do at OX Drive is we help, uh, you know, the world to transition towards a more renewable future by providing EV car sharing services, EV subscription, charging stations, as well as energy storage solutions. And uh, what we have noticed is that a lot of people and a lot of companies, um, especially outside of Western Europe, still lack the knowledge or the willingness uh, or they are just scared to uh, switch to EVs and to renewable energy. So we hope to be the, uh, you know, the stepping stone towards that. Uh, we are a company that is going to be two years old pretty soon. And so far, so good. We've hit uh, almost two million euros in revenues. So, so yeah, happy to be here, as I said. Well, thanks for joining us as well. And um, yeah, Christian, good to have you back again, yeah. still here. Found and CEO of Nexture, settled in yet? It's, it's, well. it's getting there. I'll just mention it another 11 times until it kind of <laughs> gets in there. Now, we're talking about advancements in decarbonization. And what we're going to do is, again, a very interactive discussion with you. But, but I'd be curious. Now, I have so many smart minds um, here together. And I'd like to lean, I'd really like to ask a provocative question. Is this just a problem for the first world that's relevant to urban areas with a lot of disposable income? Or is this something which could be relevant to a few more? That's a broad question to start off, I know, but I'm curious what your opinion is on that. And whoever feels obliged, just go for it and tell me I'm wrong, I, I hope. Three? Maybe. Go for it, Till. Yeah, maybe I can provide a perspective. I worked for a couple of years uh, from Tunisia in Northern Africa, so I saw a little bit also how countries in that part of the world are tackling energy problems. And I think what you see there is these countries are much more exposed, for example, to the volatility of fossil fuels. Uh, so when the prices in oil go up a lot, these countries don't have a buffer. Uh, they have a large part of a poor population that cannot really afford high prices. And then they run a spiral of high subsidies, high uh, budget, uh, sort of, or negative budgets, and then debt that they need to raise. So in that sense, they cannot afford the fossil economy either. So in that sense, I think what we do, uh, obviously we focus as a fund uh, focused on the European markets, but I think a lot of the technologies that we back, um, the solutions that we back, uh, may enable countries to leapfrog some of the mistakes that we have made in the first world uh, in terms of our dependency on fossil energy, our dependency on certain technologies that lock us into the of fossil energy, so I don't see this as, well as something that only concerns us here in, in, in Northern Europe or in the, in the European Hemisphere. 
Great, and I also saw Xiaomin getting quite nervous and Christian also heavily nodding. So we'll start with you, Xiaomin, and then Christian. You need to unmute. I'm afraid I can't okay. hear you. No, I'm unmuted. Yes, yeah, so I was, uh, I was not in agreement because I actually work in the emerging markets. And, um, and, and I think that when you look at the automotive market um, in the world, China and the U US and Europe, where you know, we're responsible for a huge chunk of, 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 of that market. Um, but I think that um, in terms of emissions, right? So these three parts of the world make up, I think over 60% of the global road transport emissions and India and then the rest of the world make up the rest. And so when we talk about the rest of the world, it's still a very significant number. And when we talk about the, you know, in, in addition to volatility and the prices and the effects on the, on the population in these more, um, in the developing world, I think that when it comes to um, air quality, um, it really has a significant impact on the health, right? I lived in China for eight years during the years where um, the pollution was very, very real and, and just horrible. Um, they're doing a great job of, you know, getting away from the ICEs and, and, and replacing a lot of the fleet with EVs. But I think the rest of the world has to do the same. And when we talk about, I think, in the emerging markets, a lot of, a lot, a lot of it's more two wheelers, um, you know, uh, maybe cheaper versions of the kinds of EVs that we're, we're thinking it's not all Teslas. Um, people have different choices. And I also think that it's a, it's, it's also a, um, it's about fleets, right? It's about commercial vehicles. It's more about um, these these buses that are transporting people from from A to B, mass transportation. So I think that the that the rest of the world faces a slightly different problem, and there's a lot of financing that needs to go into that. Um, that that a lot of um, uh, development finance institutions are very actively playing a role in helping to solve. Christian, I've noticed a lot of movement to my right. Tell us. So, um, yeah. where I want to where I want to contribute um, in, in this respect is, in, in in my thinking, I think there's a huge opportunity for for developing markets as well because they they do not necessarily have let's say the a lot of the legacy. In, in that the first world has. So I think they can even jumpstart some in term when it comes to uh, new technologies. I think key there is going to be um, the, the, the cost side, the cost efficiency of, of solutions. I think this is, this is something that, that in the next step has to be worked on to make this not just a feasible option in the Western developed world, but also in, in developing markets, where the key driver is going to be, is going to be the, also the, the definitely the money side, the cost side, right? But once that is, once that is paved out and it is a financially better option, then I think adoption can happen really, really fast because they're not necessarily the legacy structures that are putting the existing system in, let's say, in concrete. Thanks for that. And Christians, I also saw some lower jaw movement, if I saw that correctly, that you were just about to say something. Please jump in. Yeah, I guess it's because our names are essentially the same one. <laughs> I thought that you were addressing me. Yeah, that's why. That, that's what uh, I figured I would, out as well. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say, actually, it is um, it is a bit of a first, first world problem, and it's not at the same time. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about cost. Uh, the average person of this planet cannot afford an, e an EV right so probably as the average age of a car in europe is more than 10 years old so you know we're probably you know either we have to all we, we have all we all have to become richer together at the same time or we just have to wait for this secondary car market to actually happen because most evs are not are not 10 years old so so, so in that sense you know most people will drive evs when it's financially affordable and that, that's about it because uh, there are, of course, cars coming out that are cheaper um, and when more accessible, but still overwhelmingly at, at this day and age, EVs are a bit more expensive. Uh, but uh, maybe um, as a side note, we just attended Web Summit in Qatar. 
and I was in a discussion group with a person from India, from Qatar, and from Egypt. And they, um, the thing they told me was that they said, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, we, uh, we've heard it in Europe. The sustainability thing is very important for you. Um, so, you know, they, they respect, you know, they respect this maybe direction and this attitude, but at least for these people, they, um, they, in the discussion, they didn't even consider sustainability or EVs or anything of that sort. And maybe to a large extent, you know, there are countries in the world like Qatar where a gasoline does cost half a, half a euro per liter of fuel, you know? So that part of the world, you also have to convince them, you know, like that you, you can't convince them that it's, it's cheaper to operate an EV, you know, you have to convince them about the sustainability part as well. Now, what I, what I just, out of curiosity, because before we open up to Slido questions, I mean, we're just focusing quite strongly on the whole EV part, but what about up or downstream, let's call it that way, where are some of these areas where there could be massive global impact because of more sustainable EV fleets, more EV adoption? I'm curious, just, just jump in whoever feels obliged. Xiaomi, I saw you nodding quite heavily there if you'd like to take that. Yeah, so I just wanted to to say that um, I think we, we all agree that price cost is a huge issue, right, globally um, for the mass adoption of EVs. And I think in a lot of the parts of the world where huge populations are um, that are in these developing markets that a lot of the financing um, there 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 needs to be finance so if you for example like if you're operating a, a EV fleet separating the operations from the ownership of the EVs and the leasing can really help right so if there there so for example like Uber I think Uber has committed um a huge amount like 800 million dollars to help their drivers switch to EVs and Cabify in Latin America they have gotten a 40 million dollar loan from EIB um, for their fleet decarbonization project um, in Spain so all of these companies, when they're trying to do something so massive on such a massive scale, they do need some kind of financing. And a lot of it can, and some of that can be concessional financing. And that's where these institutions need to take a risk, right? They need to embrace, okay, we're going to support the decarbonization um, of, of transport globally. And this is a priority. And so it's just about what you prioritize. And so um, in terms of what, my institution, so IFC has done um, in the last couple of years is that we've committed a lot, a you know, a significant amounts uh, to partner with uh, players um, in the value chain to help to decarbonize. Thanks for that. And now I'd like to see what the actual experts have to say as in our audience. Let's have a look at some of the Slido questions. And again, you can post whatever questions you have and up and down vote them. And the most popular question here is, how is Nextshare directly and indirectly reducing CO2 emissions and how do you measure that? That's an easy question, like this could be a dissertation, but I'll give you 30 seconds, no pressure. Yes. Um, <laughs> so um, directly we've started, um, so Rebecca, who is, who is, who is somewhere there, uh, is driving our internal initiative where we as a team focus on finding out where we directly can can reduce our own CO2 emissions as a company, as a team. So that's the direct impact. The indirect impact is through the products and services that we deliver, because in a lot of cases, we enable EVs to replace ICEs in, in more or less a direct way by providing our services and making EVs also a financially more attractive option. And that obviously replaces millions of kilometers driven by gas or diesel with electric <laughs> energy. We measure that energy by kilowatt hours. We measure the kilometers driven. And we take that as the calculation baseline for the CO2 impact that we create. That was quite a precise answer. Thanks for that. 
Next press question, also from a certain anonymous. Are there already technologies that individuals can use to decarbonize or is this not relevant and should we keep looking into bigger industrial solutions? That's a great question. Again, whoever from this panel would like to take it, please go for it. So are there individual solutions or is this rather something for big corporates? So can we individuals just say, yeah, I can't change a thing? I think, I mean, maybe I can jump in here because I think to some extent uh, what we see at the moment is a big wave of moving from what used to be early adopters of these clean technologies to a more mass market. And I think EVs are a good example. I, I mean, if you look back uh, four or five years ago, I mean, those people that wanted a Tesla bought a Tesla, but they were typically wealthy, well-off early adopters. I mean, now we're entering a stage with a much bigger variety of EVs, uh, smaller cars coming to the market and in general, the market waking up. Uh, and there, indeed, now we're looking not just at a small group of people to, to drive that wave, but really the mass market, and that is all of us, basically. Um, and, and I think here we, we see similar developments, for example, also in building renovations. I mean, now we no longer talk about a few people putting solar panels on the roof, but basically everyone looking at their options for home renovations, balcony solar as a, as a low cost option, even for people that just rent apartments. So I think technology has opened up a lot of different areas now where really this is not just for the few, but for the many, if not all of us. So. Thank you very much. Should we, should we do it? We have time for one more question, I believe. So we can do that. Um, oh, yeah. Business fleets are obviously an attractive market for a company, but what role do they play specifically in decarbonization? Who could take that question? Yeah, Christian, maybe. Yeah, I thought you might take that. <laughs> um, well, business fleets, um, business fleets make up a huge amount of the cars that are out there. If you take a look at the Dach region, Germany, Austria, Switzerland alone, over between 50 and 60% of all new registrations of cars are business fleet cars. So it's the majority actually of vehicles getting out on the streets. So when, I take, when we take a look at an opportunity, it's also about the, the leverage you can have. And in the business fleets, to create an impact there allows you to create a, a, a leverage in the majority of new vehicles coming, coming on the streets. And that's, that's why it's such an attractive um, market for us from a business commercial perspective, but also from a sustainability perspective. Thanks for that. Now, again, time flies, and I've been told I have one minute remaining to try and summarize this entire panel and get your approval that the summary was okay. So no pressure on me again. Um, so let's save the world together. We understood that a lot of people are quite simply scared of the switch. That's just a fact we have to live with, but the fact we can face with. We understood that it is different in the first world or whatever we'd like to call it, in, in, let's call it the emerging markets, but that's not necessarily negative but it can be something quite positive if we understand that a lot of the mistakes we've made in our so-called first world might enable emerging markets to leapfrog exactly these challenges and problems. One of them maybe even being uh, overcoming problems such as price volatility in, in the developing world and whatnot, or quite simply, maybe stepping over something. Something we, for example, saw in the uh, mobile adoption, right? In, uh, where, where Europe wasn't as fast or the US wasn't as fast as some countries in Africa because they didn't do the whole landline part. We understood that health is a driving fact as well. At the end of the day, cost, cost efficiency as well. It's all about cost, we understood. But it's not just about focusing purely on EVs because we understood EVs are expensive. Um, but then again, it's something we can change. It's something where we understand a lot of investment has to happen. Um, it could be down to a lot of institutions, but again, they have to be willing and able to take the risk to invest in this. And we also try to understand, well, what does it mean maybe also for people who are not just driving EVs? And we saw that there's individual steps they can take, such as solar panels. And at the very end, we were able to establish that it's sometimes not just about individual effort, but about leverage. And that strong leverage can potentially be created by things like business fleets because there's a lot that can happen. That's my summary. You're happy? Yeah, happy? Approved. Panel as well, nod if you're happy. If not, now say something. That's one nod, two nod, three nods. That's quite good as well. 
looking at the audience, you're happy as well? Yeah, they're all nodding. I like that. So we kind of established there's a huge opportunity, but it's kind of hard, which is, in essence, something that entrepreneurs really love. And for me, that sounds like a market that's just waiting for change for those who are bold enough to do it, who are willing to do it, and who are able to challenge the status quo. At this point in time, what I'd like to do is I'd like to thank our panel participants and our online participants. A big thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> Bye, Tilk, Xiaomin, and Christians. Thank you very much for joining us. And Yeah, we just talked about the ones willing and able to challenge the status quo. We talked, mm -hmm. you also said it so much about being bold, about participating, about challenging, about doing things. And what we're going to do now is we're not going to stop because we have so many smart people. We're going we're gonna to start. This was just the beginning. Yes. The next step is happening right over there. And now before you all run off, what I'd like you to do is, this is always flight attendant work as I call it. You all have badges around your neck. What I'd like you to do is have a look at your badge. Don't hurt yourself. And at the back of the badge, the front is the part where it says your name. At the back, there's a number. What I'd like you to do now is with that number, get up and go through this door and look for the according number because we'll have eight individual workshops on different topics for the next round, about 20 minutes, where you got your work done. Mm -hmm. And before you go away, just for the online participants, we do have, if you still like to participate, a word cloud um, on your thoughts and opinions. Thank you very much. For all of you, write that way and go find your number and see you shortly. Thank you very much.